Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The word that I want us to focus in on this evening is the word sanctification. We're going to come across that word many times. And we need to realize that this word sanctification comes from the Hebrew word, which means holy. In other words, there's a connection between holiness and sanctification. And the word in English that helps us understand this connection is the word purpose. Whenever we talk about that which is holy, this which is holy has a God-ordained purpose. And sanctification is a process where that which is an instrument can now become an instrument unto God. One that is, is appropriate for the purposes of God. And when that holiness and that sanctification all comes together in obedience to the purpose of God, you know what the outcome is? God's glory. And there is an inherent relationship between glory and worship. And that's exactly what the scripture is going to teach us tonight. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of, of Exodus and chapter 29. Now, we began last week a passage of Scripture, Exodus 29, that dealt with a special service, a service of sanctification. And whom were being sanctified? Aaron, the first high priest, and his sons, that is, the priests that would serve with him. And the whole purpose of this sanctification is that worship might be done, and here's an important truth. We mentioned this last week. Worship brings about a change, a glorious change, where God's will is accomplished and His glory is manifested. Worship is foundational for that. So if you are a believer and you're not seeing God's will accomplished in and through your life, Maybe it's because your worship is insufficient. It is inadequate because it's not rooted in the truth of God. It's not led by the Spirit of God. It is my sincere belief, my strong opinion that today we don't see much worship going on. That which passes for worship or thought to be worship by most, is really a stench in the nostrils of God. We're going to see that two, three, four times in this 29th chapter, we saw a few last week, that it speaks about a pleasing aroma, a fragrance that is good in the nostrils of God. And it's that pleasing aspect of worship that brings change, brings provision, brings perspective whereby his people can act in a way that manifests his glory. So as I said, look with me. We began last week this chapter. God willing, we'll complete it tonight. Exodus 29, and we're going to begin in, in verse 23. Exodus 29 and verse 23. Now, we left off in the midst of this sanctifying service. And we see that there was a bull that was mentioned. And not only one bull, but two rams. And other things and elements that were used for this sanctification 
service. And one of the reasons why a bull is mentioned is the bull is seen as the supreme offering from a Old Testament perspective. It was the most costly. And the bull has a connection with Aaron, the high priest. But his sons, we see that it was those two rams. And then we see that there was an emphasis, and this is what we're going to begin with this evening. We mentioned last week, simply in the introduction, that there were three types of unleavened bread. Now, realize, I get this question a lot, especially during Passover time. See, bread can be leaven or unleavened. And matzah, matzah still has the general classification as bread. So when it says he took the bread, we don't know in the book of Matthew and other Gospels, when it says simply he took bread, there's nothing in that that tells us whether it's leavened bread or unleavened bread. But because it was Passover time when Yeshua took the bread, it had to be unleavened bread. And that term for unleavened is matzah. And we saw last week three times that that term was used for a, a loaf of bread, and then a special type of loaf of bread called challah. And then third, it was used for a, a wafer. And we're going to talk about how they are used in this sanctification service of the priests. This is where it begins, where we left off last week in verse 33. In the midst of dealing with these rams and the blood and the garments to sanctify Aaron and the priests, we continue on and it says, and the kikar lechem. Now, the word kikar is a word for a loaf. So the loaf of bread, this is a regular unleavened bread loaf. It says also the challah. And this was the challah that we spoke about last week, this unique loaf of bread that was anointed with oil. And here we just simply have the challah bread with one oil, meaning that was anointed with this unique oil. And also the rakik, rakik is the ancient word for a wafer. It was also unleavened. So one wafer cake, and all of this was taken, notice what it says, taken from the basket. And this basket had matzot, meaning it all was unleavened. Whether we're talking about the loaf, whether we're talking about the challah, or whether we're talking about the rakik, all of it, the loaf, the challah, and the wafer, all of it was unleavened. And it was kept in, as we spoke of last week, this basket for this purpose. So it's taken from the, the basket of unleavened bread, which is before the Lord. And this has significance, this, this unleavened bread being before the Lord. It was pish position, in other words, in his presence. And we know that unleavenedness has to do with an absence of sin. An absent leaven, it swells. And so there's an absence of pride. And what it teaches us from a practical standpoint is simply this. We cannot be placed in the presence of God in the attitude of pride. And there's an inherent relationship between pride and sin. When you have pride, you are going to be demonstrating, behaving sinfully. There's just no other way about it. And it's only when you have humility that you are in a position where you can serve God. So these things are, are being taught here by the utensils and the elements that are being used in this sanctification service. Look now to verse, verse 24. And you shall set everything. Now, Moses is the official. 
He is the one that presides over the sanctification service of the high priests, his brother Aaron, and his sons. And this, we're going to see, takes place for seven days. Here again, seven. If someone tells you that seven is the number of completion, I hear that so much from from many Bible teachers, this is incorrect. It is the number 10 that represent completion or entirety. It is the number seven that relates to holiness, to the purpose of God. And that's why this sanctification service, it's not complete because it's done. Several times whenever the priest, the high priest is replaced or there's a new group of priests that are placed into the mishmerit, the rotation, this service is repeated. So it is not a complete service in the sense it's done once and for all and never again, but it has a purpose to it, a purpose that holiness is brought into the children of Israel. All of this is for the children of Israel to be placed in a position where they can be brought near in worship unto the Lord. So look again at verse 24. And you shall set everything upon the palms. And we have the word yad for hand. And we have the word here kapayim for for palms. So you shall set everything upon the palms of Aaron and upon the palms of his son. And you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Now, this wave offering, realize, other times, and we'll learn more about that, for example, if you study the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23, and that special service called Rishit, having to do with the the beginning of the harvest, the wheat or the barley harvest that took place within the Passover season leading up to Pentecost. Those 50 days, Rishit is the first day of the counting of these 50 days that, that were between Resurrection Sunday and Pentecost. And there's this wave offering that signifies victory. And what is the context for understanding victory here? Because this wave offering, this wave offering had to do with raising up the hands. And it signifies victory. And there's an inherent relationship here between victory and worship. Victory and being positioned in the will of God. So we may need to have an adjustment on how we understand victory, how we understand prosperity, how we understand that which is good. It all relates to being where God wants you to be, being a recipient of his provision so that you can accomplish his will by obeying his word. That's what victory, that's what overcoming is. So victory is seen inherently tied to worshiping God. So you may be poor, you may be sick, you may have have many problems if you're in your life, but if you are worshiping God, you are overcoming. You are are exemplifying victory. So look again, verse 24, this wave offering before the Lord. Now verse 25. And you shall take them from their hand. So after they wave them, Moses is supervising. He's the official, putting this all into practice, sanctifying them. And after he places these things upon Aaron's palms and the palms of his sons, it says here in verse 25, you shall take them from their hands. And what do we do? He says here, that you, and it's the same word for a type of burning, and the emphasis, and we talked about this last week, it's similar. We find the word for incense in this word for burning. So the emphasis is burning for the smoke to go up to the Lord. So you shall burn it upon the the altar concerning this, this 
burnt offering, and it shall be for a reach nikoach lifne Hashem. It shall be a pleasing fragrance before the Lord, a fire offering unto the Lord. So we're told in a couple different ways that this is a fire offering. It goes up a burnt offering in order that it might be pleasing unto the Lord. And this underscores that, that worship, the work of the priests, which is worship, mediating worship of the children of Israel unto the Lord. It's all for God's pleasure. Now, this is a, a big reality, meaning this. It is an important reality to realize that worship is to be pleasing to Him. I wonder today when people plan out worship services, are they really relying upon the Word of God, God's instructions? Do they really have a desire to think what will be pleasing to God? Or are they more concerned with pleasing man? Realize something. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, such an incredibly important verse. He says, if I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of God. It's just that simple. Man pleasers are not pleasers of God. They're not serving God. They're not a faithful instrument of God. No, when we serve men, we become an instrument of displeasure, an instrument that will experience God's judgment. Whether it's discipline or it's wrath, that dep depends upon our, our covenantal, our covenantal uh, status, but it's going to bring displeasure from the Lord. Look now to, to verse 26. He's still instructing Moses, and he says, You shall take the breasts of the ram, and this is this ram for the inauguration service. We're going to keep coming back to that in actuality. We never leave it. All of this is for the inauguration of the priests, the high priests, and the other priests, in order that they might lead the children of Israel in worship. So you take the breast of this, this ram that was part of the inauguration service, and we know that there's two, which was the ram that was for Aaron, and once again, you wave it as a wave offering before the Lord. So there's two rams. One is for Aaron. One is for the regular priests. Now we're dealing with that ram and the breast that was for that ram or of that ram, its part, it is a wave offering unto the Lord. And it says, keep reading here, verse 26 at the end, not only is a wave offering before the Lord, but it shall be to you for a portion. Now, this has to do with that which is received by, by him. Verse 27, still speaking to Moses, and you shall sanctify this, this breast as a wave offering and also the shok. Now, the shok is the leg. I know that, that I believe the King James says the shoulder, but uh, what it's speaking about here is in this ram. It's not the shoulder, but it's the leg portion, the upper leg portion that is being, being taken here in this service. So it's also this choke, this, this leg, and it shall be a lifting up. Now, it's also a type of offering, but we have to understand there's the word tnufa, which is a waving back and forth. And there's also what's called here the truma, which is a lifting up. So similar, one is simply lifted up, the other one is lifted up and waved. And we read here concerning this, that you shall sanctify this, this breast wave offering and its, its leg as a lifting up. And it says that this shall be done by lifting up 
by waving it. And it shall be from the ram, which is part of the inauguration service, which was to Aaron and also to his sons. So notice here, both in the end are done for Aaron, the high priest, and also for his sons. So verse 26 and verse 27 is so important. Let's go back to verse 27. It says, and you shall sanctify. This means you set apart this, this breast as first a wave offering and then this, this leg as a, a lifting up which is also woven, or I should say waved, and lifted up from the ram for this inauguration service for both Aaron and also for his sons. Now look at verse 28. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons as Chok Ola. Now some will say an eternal statue. But it's a statue, and the word here for olam can also mean this world. It, it, it continues, and it has kingdom ramifications. Now, the reason why we know this is that it says that it's from the children of Israel, meaning they need to demand this. They need to expect this. It's part of the worship that, that goes on first in the tabernacle and later in the temple, that it will be for a, a offering, and this is this lifting up, this offering of lifting up. It is a lifting up shall be from the children of Israel. What does that mean? It means that all of this is to lift up, and the reason why we have these two words, nufa for waving, and the word truma for lifting up, and the word truma can also be an offering, in a general sense, but it's from the word to lift up. And there's two primary purposes for this. Number one, we see that there's a change in perspective. Lifting something up, you see things differently. You're on the ground floor and you go up to the top floor, the roof, you see things differently. And it also implies that there's a movement, a change. This is also what the priesthood are called to mediate to the children of Israel, a change that only worship can bring about. So all of this is done. Look again, verse 28. And it shall be for Aaron and for his sons as this, this chok olam from the children of Israel for a lifting up or an offering. It is an offering. It shall be from the children of Israel. From, then it says, the sacrifices of their fullness or their peace. It's a word here, shalmehem. This means that it brings them into, and here's the key, the word here, shlamim, brings them into their fullness, the completeness, so that they can begin to function. That's what it's saying. This is a sanctifying service. It is inaugurating them to carry out their work so that they'll be complete and ready for serving God. So in doing so, we have these offerings, these sacrifices, which are their, their offering unto the Lord. Verse 29. And in the holy garments, these are these priestly garments, which are for Aaron, they shall be for his sons after him to anoint among them, to fill among them their hand. Now, what is this speaking about? Well, when we get to verse, verse 29, it simply foreshadows because this is ongoing, a chok olam. It's not just for that generation. Aaron's going to die. There's going to be another high priest taken from the priest. And there's going to be other priests once they become the age of 20, that are going to be inaugurated as well. So this statue, ongoing, it continues, and it has kingdom ramifications to it. Verse, verse 30, this inauguration service of sanctification of the priest, it's for seven days, once more. That number seven appears. Seven days, 
that you shall, shall dress them, the priests, in his place. Meaning, when there's a, a machlif, the word machlif is a substitute, a replacement. So when you do the replacement for Aaron, you do the same seven-day service. And also from his sons, which will come to the tent of the meeting to serve in holiness, to serve in sanctification. Also, they as well have to have this sanctification service when they are inaugurated into the priestly call, that priestly work at the tabernacle, and then later on in the temple. It continued on, verse 31. Here, once more, we're going to see this emphasis upon the ram being used in order to inaugurate that. Now, some will point out that we have the same word as we do in Genesis 22, with the binding of Isaac, Akidat Yitzchak, and the substitution was that, that ram that was caught in the thicket by his horn. And this all brought about a change, a, a, a teaching concerning what God was going to do in order to bring about his change in this world through a substitute. So we see this being first taught in this, this rotation of, of the priests that they serve. And I'm not speaking about the, the annual rotation, the mishmarot of the priests going up and serving twice a year in a, a shift and then on the holidays. But I'm talking about this inaugurating a new group of priests each year when they turn 20 to begin to serve with the other priests. And it says in verse 31, and the ram of this inauguration service you shall take and you shall cook its flesh and you shall do so, it says, be makom kadosh, in a holy place. What does that mean? A place that is set apart, sanctified for this mitzvah, this commandment, and nothing else. You don't do anything else in this location but what it says here, that you cook this ram, what, what we have, set apart for this service. Verse 32. And Aaron shall eat, and not just Aaron, but his sons, they shall eat the flesh of this ram and also the bread. This would be all this unleavened bread that was in the basket. And they do so where? They do so at the door of the tent of the meeting. Why at this door? Here again, it brings them into the service. It's where they begin to serve and meet God. And you're going to see this meeting of God is going to be foundational. It is going to be emphasized before we conclude. So they eat it together, both Aaron and his sons, later on other high priests that were put into service, and the priests that would come after, they would all eat it at the door of the tent of the meeting, verse 33. And they shall eat them, all of these things, which was made for atonement among them. Now, it's interesting because the word atonement is used. What's an atonement? Well, this word here, kupar, being atoned, has to do with a covering. And it means here that they have been covered. What's been covered? Their own personal inadequacy. Their sin has been dealt with, but here's the key. We see that atonement only has temporal implications. And that's why many times people ask me about Bible translations. And some will say, well, what do you think about the Revised Standard Version? And it's a very 
accurate one. It's a very good one. But, but I always, if I recommend it, I always do so with qualifications. Why? Because the word Alma, which means virgin, the RSV, they don't want to translate virgin because the, the editors didn't believe literally in a virgin birth. I do. That birth of Messiah Miriam, that is Mary, she was a virgin. She had not known a man when she conceived, and she still did not know a man until after Yeshua was born. So I believe strongly in the virgin birth. The RSV does not. When it translates Isaiah 7, 14, it simply says a maiden, and that's a poor translation. Likewise, when we look into the book of Hebrews, we have the word propitiation. This word means not an atonement. It's stronger than atonement. Propitiation has to do with not a covering or a temporary dealing. It is an eternal removal. It's more closely related to the outcome of redemption. So many times a translation may be, be good in many, many places and overall, but it has some problems, just like the King James. Instead of in the book of Acts chapter 12, instead of rightly speaking about Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they take a word that's pagan. They take the word Easter. We ought not say that word. That word Easter is a pagan word. It comes from a, a pagan service of, fut of fertility. That's why eggs and bunny rabbits, they have nothing whatso whatsoever to do with something as holy as the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Jesus. So let me just simply say, if you at that time of year have Easter eggs and bunnies, that is an abomination before God. It is something that is offensive. It is something that shows an ignorance and a, an unaware of truth. So put it away. Stop doing things that are not rooted in Scripture. The whole purpose that we're going through this section verse by verse, slowly looking at every word is so that we can learn principles. And we see that everything must be followed by, by Moses. If the priests are going to be sanctified for service, if something is, is neglected, what's going to happen? This worship, these activities of the priests are not going to be received by God. So realize if the high priest heirs he dies that's how important right worship is let's mature and not be rooted in a pagan culture or traditions of men let's get serious let's get biblically grounded let's be students of the word of god and not imitators of the world and vain and traditions of abomination that's what God desires, and that's what he commands. So we read here, look at once more, verse 33. And they shall eat them, which, and it's speaking about these things that were used for atoning, which atone for them, in order that their hand might be full, that means that they might be inaugurated, that they might be given authority, and to, to sanctify them. And it says, Ve zar lo yochal ki kadosh hem. Which means a, and the word zar means foreigner. But when it means foreigner, it doesn't mean someone who's not Jewish. It means someone who is not a Levite and above that, one that, that, that is not from the family of Aaron. So a Levite could not be, just because he was a Levite, that was not enough of the criteria being met. All the priests were from the tribe of Levite. 
but not all Levites were from the family of Aaron. So this word for stranger implies someone who is not a descendant of Aaron. Such a one cannot eat, cannot serve, because these things are set apart. Verse 34. And if should remain from the flesh of this inauguration offering, or from the bread, if any remains unto morning, it is unable to be eaten. It says here, you shall burn it, whatever remains, with fire, and he shall not eat it, for it is holy. It's set apart for this service. And if any of it was not consumed in the midst of this service and it remained the next day, it could not be consumed. It was forbidden. Now look, if you would, to verse 35. And you shall do this for Aaron and for his sons. Kacha. What's kacha? Kacha is a Hebrew word which means thus or like this. And it's not a casual word. It's a very specific word. When you say kacha, you mean exactly like this. So you shall do this for Aaron and his sons exactly at this, as according to all which I have commanded you seven days in order to, to fulfill their hand, meaning give them authority to install them, to inaugurate them in this service. Verse 36. And the bull that was for the sin offering, you shall do. Leon. And the implication is each of these seven days concerning these atonements, it shall be a sin offering concerning or upon the altar for your atonement, you making atonement concerning it, meaning concerning this, this mizbeach, this altar. And you shall sanctify it, and, and it, you shall anoint it for its sanctification. Let me say that correct. You shall anoint it for its sanctification. So all of this is done in order that Aaron and his sons and the altar is all atoned for and prepared for worship there. Look at verse 37. Seven days you shall make atonement concerning this altar, that you sanctify it, and it shall be an altar of the most holiness. Now, what it's speaking about is this. We know that there is the Kodesh Kodeshim, the most holy place. And there's the holy place. And in the outside of the, the holy place is the courtyard where the altar was. And what it's saying here is this. If this is all, all fulfilled, it has, and hear this carefully, the status of the most holy, meaning this. If everything that's being done is done properly, kaha, exactly right, that same holiness that dwelt upon the kaporah, that mercy seat, that covering of the Ark of the Covenant between the, the kruvim, the cherubim, over the Ark of the Covenant, they would experience that same presence of God. That's what it was about that the children of Israel could, could experience the holiness of God personally through this priestly service. That's what it's saying here. If you read it carefully, and it shall be this altar, the most holy, the holy of holies, and all that touch the altar will be sanctified. What does that mean? Well, this altar is for the sin offering, among other offerings. And it's all when this work is done properly, it sanctifies the children of Israel unto their service of God. So it begins with the priests, but it continues on. And the purpose is for all Israel. We say, Klau Yisrael, all of Israel, 
to be sanctified in the work of God. Well, let's press on to our last section very quickly. Look at verse 38. And this has to do with the, the daily service. The service that was done each day in the tabernacle and then the temple thereafter. The daily offering. Verse 38. And this you shall do upon the altar. There is a now a growing emphasis in this altar. And what shall be done? These kivasim. Kivasim is lambs. Lambs that are one year old, and you shall do two, meaning two sacrifices each day, and it's always, each and every day, always. There's no exception of this special sacrifice. So one lamb you shall do in the morning, and the second one you shall do ben ha Ben ha arbaim. Ben ha arbaim means at twilight, at the end of the day. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean at, at sundown, at the end, but it can be done according to tradition from the ninth hour, which is about three in the afternoon, unto the setting of the sun. So one in the morning, shacharit, and one in the, the late afternoon. And with these sacrifices of these lambs, look at verse 40. There shall be a tenth part of this fine flour that's mixed with oil. And it should be an oil that has been beaten. And it's one-fourth of a hen. That is a measurement, one-fourth of a hen. This, this oil which is beaten and mixed with this flour. And then it goes on to say there's also with it a libation of one-fourth of a hen of wine, and this is for one lamb. So these things, this, this flour that is mixed with oil that is beaten, meaning it's pressed and it's, it's baked into a pulp, this oil from the olive oil. And it's mixed with a libation of not water but of wine this is done for each of these these uh two lambs one in the morning and one in the late afternoon verse 41 and the second lamb you shall do between the the ben ha arbaim literally means at twilight according to the offering of the morning and according to its libation, it shall be done to it that it becomes, and here it is again, a, a pleasing fragrance, a pleasing aroma, a fire offering unto the Lord. Verse 42. And it's a burnt offering because it's all consumed. It's a burnt offering continuously day in and day out throughout your generations it's done here at the tent of the meeting, at the doorway of the tent of the meeting before the Lord. And when we do that, notice what he says. God is making a promise, which I will meet. Now, in modern Hebrew, it's the word va'ad, which is like a committee. The purpose of meeting for a decision, for a revelation. And this is why I say so frequently that worship, worship leads to revelation. So God is promising to meet us there. He says, I will meet you there to speak unto you there at that location. What location? That doorway of the tent of the meeting. To bring them into a greater intimacy with God. Greater revolu revelation. Verse, verse 43. And I will, and it's this same word for, for testifying, for a purpose, for a, a, a designation, meaning a reason. He says, I will, will meet you there among the children of Israel, and I will be sanctified in my holiness. So all of this is to bring the presence of God and his sanctifying influence to the children of Israel that the glory of God 
is manifested. And, and we, we can't overemphasize what this verse is revealing. We see that there are those who have been called, anointed, sanctified for work. They do that work, and in doing so, they mediate, and a priest is a mediator. They mediate an experience between God and the people of Israel, his covenant people. In order that they might meet God, experience God, that God might testify and bring about his designated purpose. And what is that? That God be sanctified among them and his glory is manifested. And when God's glory is manifested, his work is accomplished. God goes to work to fulfill his purposes through us. And that's why he says that, that, that we'll be sanctified in my holiness. Verse 44. Over and over in this last section, we see this word sanctified over and over appearing. And I will be sanctified at the tent of the meeting and at this altar and with Aaron and his sons, I will be sanctified for their service unto me. What does that mean? That God will function according to his purposes for them. Without that priesthood, God won't function and bring about his will in their life. So what's the takeaway from this? Very simply, we learn that it's worship that brings about the purposes of God in our life. And if we don't worship properly, God's will won't be accomplished. His sanctification, remember sanctification is related to purpose. His purposes won't be accomplished. Look now to, to verse 45. Not only is worship going on, God's will being done, but it brings God intimately into the life of the people. Verse 45, and I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel, and I will be to them for God. Now, usually we have this expression that they will be to me for a people, and I will be to them for a God. But we don't see that. We simply see God saying, I am going to be their God. I am going to take responsibility over them. I'm going to. It all speaks about his faithfulness to his people. Once again, I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel and I will be to them or for them for God. And they shall know, this is this revelation that I keep speaking about, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. And notice this is all tied to redemption because we have the exodus from Egypt. When I bring them out from the land of Egypt and I will dwell in your midst, I am the Lord their God. Now, what's interesting is this. They've already come out. They are out Mount Sinai when this is taking place. And it all to tell them, this is all to tell them, that I brought you out for a redemptive purpose. I brought you out to worship me. And this worship will position you and give you my provision where you can fulfill my purposes, that my sanctification is manifested in you and in the end, my glory is seen. So all of this shows a, a structure. It shows a process that must be done if the children of Israel are going to give testimony, bear witness that they are the covenant people of God. And may I close with this by saying, all of this has greatly important principles and instructions that we need to take into our new covenant worship. And if we ignore these things, what do we have? Well, we have the foolishness that's going on in so many places today 
when instead of emphasizing the presence of the Holy Spirit, no, they want to bring fog and smoke. And instead of manifesting the glory of God, they do so with artificial lighting and strobes and everything, not to represent the ways of God, but to represent a nightclub. We are so far removed from the instructions of God because we believed a lie that does not speak of sanctification, the purposes of God, but we have believed the lie that God, that he's concerned and is wanting to fulfill our purposes. That's not holiness. That's not sanctification. That has nothing to do with worship. That's all about idolatry. So let me close with this. Ask yourself, is my worship of God more closely related to a biblically inspired, a scripturally sound worship that we read about throughout the scripture? Or is my worship more related to a worldly approach of having a good time, a celebration, a party, a nightclub experience? God wants change. He's willing to receive those who come before him humbly and with a desire to change according to his definition of change so that they might accomplish his purposes and experience sanctification so that his glory is manifested in and through their life. In other words, it's time to get serious. Close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.